It's a real pleasure on my part to be able to introduce to you Brother Dan Manuel. Of course, most of you at Brown Trail already know Dan because he's been here before. He's no stranger to any of you. But I'm first of all going to read what I have written down here concerning his uh, biography information. He began preaching in 1965 and has done local work in Hallsville and Dallas and Linden and Buna, Nach Natchitoches, I suppose it's pronounced, and has been with the Crockett Road Church in uh, uh, Palestine now for 30 years, where he serves, uh, is it more than 30 years? 35 years, boy how time flies, 35 years at Crockett Road where he serves not only as the local preacher but also uh, as one of the elders there. And he has preached in well over 300 gospel meetings and I know, I know somewhat uh, what is involved in that. He is the author of a, a number of works, many articles and class material and he's done extensive television work and Dan and his wife Audrey have two children and I'm very thankful that Audrey is with us tonight. And also some of their dear friends from uh, Palestine, Bob and Mary Steck are also with them. Having said all of that, now let me tell you just a little bit more. I first started hearing of Dan when I preached for the Cameron Road Church in Austin, Texas. And I would hear remarks such as this, there's such a talented man up, up at such and such place and He's just so talented. Well, of course, I, I accepted what they said, but I didn't know until I met him myself. And sure enough, he is so talented. I couldn't begin to tell you how talented this man is. Not only is he a great gospel preacher, but he's a great song leader and a great musician. In fact, uh, he started a, a, a country uh, music uh, program down in Palestine about two or three years ago, if my memory serves me correctly, and it so impressed the uh, city fathers that they asked him to use the uh, municipal auditorium, as we would call it there. And so this uh, work assumed uh, the name of the Dogwood Jamboree. And uh, Brother Joe, who preached for us uh, already on this lectureship, is one of the uh, band members uh, in Dan's show, and I was privileged to perform on it back about two or three months ago, and uh, I, I was amazed at the talent that Dan has, a tremendous musician, but his first love is the Lord's cause, and that's why I love him so much and appreciate him so very much, and you're going to be thrilled to, to hear him preach tonight on the subject of the Lord's highway uh, from Isaiah chapter 35, and I know you'll be stirred in your hearts to think about uh, the way that God has provided for us. Dan, this is a little blue box, and it starts at 38 minutes, and it goes downhill, and you can stop anywhere along the way that you want to, but you can't go over 38 minutes. I, I gave them back 13 seconds when I spoke. I thought I was gonna spend 36 years at Palestine before we got started. Maxie, I, uh, I appreciate uh, very much your kind remarks, and I appreciate this good congregation, and I appreciate so much the opportunity to be here, and I really will be very careful to make sure that I quit on time. Uh, you know, I was holding a gospel meeting out in the state of Arizona some time ago, and uh, I was uh, preaching away, and uh, the more I'd preach, the brethren would begin with uh, amen, uh, praise the Lord, those kind of things. And, uh, you know, the, the more they would do that, the more I'd preach. And time kind of escaped me, but I noticed that the local preacher, every time they'd say amen, he'd say, amen, Pharaoh. And I'd look at him... <laughs> And I thought, what in the world is this guy doing? You know, they'd say amen. And every time they'd say amen, he'd say, amen, Pharaoh. Well, after the service was over that night, I walked back to the back and I stood there and everybody had left and it kind of got my curiosity up. And I looked at him, I said, John, I said, listen, I, I noticed when I was preaching tonight that all, all the brethren were amening what I said, but all you had to say was amen, Pharaoh. And I said, what was that all about? And he says, well, I'll tell you very, very succinctly and very bluntly. And I said, well, what was it? He said, I said, I said, amen, Pharaoh, uh, let my people go. Well, anyway, I'll, uh, I'll try to let you go tonight and get you out on time. 
but uh, I appreciate all of you that uh, are here. You know, this is a wonderful day, and even in spite of the bad weather, God has blessed us. We needed the rain. By the way, all of this is a rain that you and I were praying about last summer, and aren't you glad that it has come? Amen? Amen. Now, I want to tell you, the Bible has much to say about the highway of the Lord. In the book of Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 8, and nestled in those verses that uh, perhaps you would have read before you got here tonight, in verses 1 through 10, uh, the Bible talks about the highway of God. The prophet said, and a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. He says, the unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. You know, that, that statement must have provoked a lot of questions in the minds of those who read Isaiah's scroll. And probably even just a casual perusal uh, would provoke a lot of questions in their mind. What is the prophet talking about? I mean, 700 years before Jesus came on the scene, and they were probably wondering, what does this prophet uh, mean by all of this? What is he really talking about? However, they did not know what we are privy to today as we read the Word of God from our vantage point. We know that the highway of the Lord or the way to heaven is the way that leads to Jesus Christ our Savior. But many who read that scroll no doubt wanted to be set free uh, from the shackles of their sin. Uh, but they didn't know exactly what Isaiah was talking about. But you know, when you read the Old Testament, and certainly in the New Testament, you come to the realization that God has never, nor does he today, allow his people to flounder out in a sea of sin without a way of escape. I believe tonight that many of us need to understand that God always and always has done and will tonight provide a way of escape on the highway that leads to heaven. Isaiah describes the blessings that accompany those who traverse the Lord's highway. He says it is a highway of joy, it is a highway of peace, it is a highway of many wonderful blessings including pardon and forgiveness. Now what is the Lord's highway anyway? How would you really describe it? That's what I want to do for you in the next few moments. I've come to believe that the Lord's highway or the highway to heaven is a holy way. We in the church today oftentimes uh, have rejected the will of God when it talks about the holiness of God's people. Many of us want to embrace and include even those who are living in sin and bring them into the fellowship of God's dear church. Now, I'm not the judge, folks. I never have endeavored to be the judge, but I want to tell you something. There is a mighty judge, and his name is Jehovah God, and we must, we must follow his will if we're going to honor him. I believe that the church needs to purge itself of those that are harming and dividing the body of Christ because of their immorality and their sin. You don't see it practiced too much anymore, but we often wonder sometimes why the church is in digression instead of progression. And I want to tell you something, many of the erroneous doctrines uh, that are being sounded out in the brotherhood of our Lord today are not progressive in any way. Now, people choose to call themselves progressive, but really, I believe, according to the will of God, it is digressive. And yet, I believe that the way of God is the way of holiness. You know, I, some time ago, someone asked me, they said, well, uh, are, are you folks holiness? And I said, you bet we are. <laughs> you know what? We are holiness. We got to be a holy people. We often sing that song, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And we talk about the fact that we want to be holy before God as well. Only those who have been made pure will ever be able to enter the Lord's highway. That's why Peter said to purify your souls in obedience to the truth. You know, there are two things that God wants to do for you and for me. Did you know when we experience salvation in Christ, God does two things. He first of all purifies us and pardons us. He purifies us in that he makes us free from our sin. He gets us on the right track. He gets on the way to lead to heaven 
And then he pardons us from all of our past sins. And thank God that he does. The prophet Isaiah, over in the book of Isaiah chapter 3, the Bible tells us that Isaiah begins again to acknowledge the holiness of God. Listen to what the prophet said. The prophet said that he had heard the voice of God. He had seen in a vision the holiness of the Lord. He understood well what the Bible teaches about the holiness of God. He says, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Sometimes we want to embrace the unholy things in life. Isn't it amazing that in today's world we have brethren who are telling us that homosexuality is not against the will of God, that it is just an alternate lifestyle, that there's nothing impure about such behavior at all. But yet when you read in the book of Romans chapter 1, the Bible says that God gave people up who practiced the, quote, gay lifestyle because they dishonored their bodies among themselves. I don't know that there's any other passage in all of the Bible where it really says that God gave anybody up, but he does here. Because of their vile, their filthiness, their unholiness before God. The highway to holiness, or the Lord's highway, will allow you and it allows me to exchange our despair for confidence in Jesus. God allows us to exchange our weakness for his power, John 1 and verse 12. For to them that receive him gave he the power of God to become the sons of God. The Lord's highway is a holy way, and we must never, ever forget it. What really bothers me in today's world, and we often talk about how unholy and how impure the world is getting. I want to tell you something, folks. There is a great danger facing the body of Christ today. And if we don't start preaching again and teaching the will of God concerning the holiness of God and the holiness of his people, the church will only go further into digression. Appreciate our brother saying what he had to say a moment ago about standing up for what is right. You know what? We need preachers of the gospel again who stand up and preach the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The Lord's highway not only is a holy way, but it is a simple way. It is a way that is easy to understand. Now, I don't believe anybody just kind of stumbles on the Lord's highway, but I believe that we get on the Lord's highway because it is a simple way. It's the way, it's an easy way to enter. The Bible says, The wayfaring men yet fools shall not err therein. You see, the truth of Jesus is very simple, always has been. And we've often said in the church, and we've often prided ourselves about the fact that, you know what, even little children can understand the will of God. And isn't it amazing? That sometimes those who make the trek down the aisle, down to the front to give their hearts to Jesus are young children whose hearts can be touched by the power of the gospel when calloused hearts of long age no longer surrender. Truth must be learned and correctly obeyed. And God has made his way visible for all people. Many will not enter that way because of their own self-inflicted blindness, however, and they refuse to see. You know, it doesn't take a scientist from Harvard or even someone from many of the so-called Christian universities in the Brotherhood to be able to explain the doctrine of Jesus and the way to heaven. The Bible says that he that goeth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. And yet we've got a lot of brethren today that have gotten off the highway of the Lord. And we've started, they too have started traversing their own trail, which will lead to tears and unhappiness. God's way is a simple way. It's not difficult for people to comprehend and understand. But let me share with you another thing. 
When I read that prophecy of Isaiah as he talks about the coming of the Lord and the highway that leads to heaven, I see it as a way that really is narrow. Now, you know, sometimes, and our brother mentioned a moment ago about the fact that sometimes people know the church only by what we stand against and what we stand for. You know, what really bothers me in the church today is sometimes we, we always talk about what's wrong with the church and what's right about the church is what we ought to be talking about. And there's some very wonderful things going on in the body of Jesus. I want to tell you the fires of evangelism are still burning in the kingdom of God, and we need to get back to start preaching the truth that will set men free. You know, there was a time in our history when, when preachers stood up and really preached the truth. They weren't afraid to preach the narrowness of the will of God. But we've, we've almost gotten to the point that we are so fearful to take a stand. Many would suspend the teaching concerning the narrowness of the Lord's highway. But let me remind you what Jesus taught in the book of Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. He said, try to enter at the straight gate, for straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few there be that find it. But broad is the way, and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Nothing could be more profound than the teaching of Jesus. And people that say, well, you folks are just too narrow. And I want to tell you something. I do, Max. You have an opportunity, and I, I thank God for that, to be able to go all over this country and preach the gospel in gospel meetings and revivals, whatever you want to call them. I guess the word revival is just as uh, justifiable as gospel meeting. I don't know. But I know one thing, that wherever I go, generally the church it becomes fragmented and divided over people who have left the narrowness of God's way. Isn't it amazing sometimes when we, if you're going to have surgery, you want to get the finest surgeon possible. You want to make sure that he moves with precision when he starts working on your body. Don't you? Several years ago when I was down in Palestine, I was at the church building one night and started having pain in my neck, Maxine, and down my shoulders and I thought, my goodness, what's going on here, you know? And before long, they had me out at the hospital. I had suffered a heart attack. Luckily, I got there. Say, so luckily, the Lord was behind all of this. Got to the hospital, and they told me that I had a cardio infarction going on right then. And they called my wife, got her there, and uh, they gave me a clot buster, dissolved the clot right then. But then on Monday, they took me over to Tyler, Texas, where I met a Dr. David Dick, who was a cardiologist and physician. And anyway, that afternoon, he came in, and he introduced himself to me, and he said, Are you Reverend Manuel? And I thought, boy, this is no time to get into a theological argument over that word. I wanted him to think I was about as revered as anybody. <laughs> well, he walked over and he introduced himself to me, started talking to me, and I said, look, and he said, you've, you've had a heart attack, but we're going to do a, a little procedure here where we go up in your heart and look and see if there's any problem going on, and, and if there is, we're going to take care of it. And I said, well, that sounds fine. I said, uh, I really appreciate you doing this. And he said, oh, no, you, <laughs> I appreciate you asking me to do it. And I said, oh, no, I, listen, I, I want you to know how much I really appreciate you doing this. And he said, well, you don't appreciate it as much as me. He said, I've always wanted to do one of these things. I said, say what? <laughs> well, he was jesting with me, and I, come to, I came to understand that. But I wanted to make sure that before anybody went into this ticker, <laughs> listen, he knew what he was doing. Now, when it comes to spiritual matters, why is it that we say, well, any old way will do. It really doesn't make any difference. Go ahead and believe what you want to believe. Do what you want to do. You've heard people say, well, all roads lead to heaven. We're all trying to get there. It doesn't really make any difference how you get there. Let me tell you something, brethren. All roads may have led to Rome, but not all roads lead to heaven. 
Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. It is easy sometimes for people to be misled. And it can happen. Accidents happen all the time. People stumble. People are misled. Solomon said there's a way that appears right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. Several years ago, I was called upon to conduct a memorial service for a woman who had died. Her husband said that she loved Elvis Presley so much. Anything wrong with Elvis? She loved Elvis so much that he wanted to play her favorite Elvis song at the funeral. Well, they had a little guy back there in that booth. And, and they wanted to play that song as the family was marching in. It was the song, Love Me Tender. Remember that song? Remember that song, Maxie? Well, for some reason or another, the guy who was operating the sound system got a little bit confused. And when the family started walking down the aisle, they started playing Return to Cinder. <laughs> it is easy sometimes, <laughs> it is easy sometimes for people to be misled. There is a right way, there is a wrong way. Everything is not gray, and even though there's some tonight that would have us believe that nothing is absolute anymore, and what defined the church, you know what? We got people today trying to reinvent the Lord's highway. We got people who are trying to invent, reinvent the Lord's church. The Bible says there is one Lord, there is one faith, there is one baptism. There is one God who is above all, in all, and through all, and there still is one. Never was it in the mind of God that there be a multiplicity or an amalgamation of ways that lead to heaven. But we go through Jesus. In John chapter 10, verse 1 through 9, Jesus taught that a man must walk through the door that is through Jesus. If he's going to be a part of the sheepfold. The Lord's highway, fourthly, is a secure way. Now I know this is going to sound strange and I want you to think about what I'm saying here tonight. Someone asked me one time, they said, do you believe in the security of the believer? I said, you better believe that I believe in the security of the believer. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. People have come to believe that the security of the believer means that you can't fall from grace. I'm not saying that tonight. I believe that the Lord's highway or the highway to heaven is a secure way. As long, and here it is, folks, and put it in context here. As long as I am traveling the Lord's highway, I am secure. I believe in the security of the believer. And for all of those who would say you can't fall from grace, you need to go back and read about the insecurity of the believer who does fall from grace. In the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul says, There is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. Now listen, people stop right there. We need to read page 2, as Paul Harvey says. He said, listen to it again. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. There's your security. When a man is walking after the Spirit and he is traversing again or traveling the highway that leads to heaven, there is security for such a believer. When we leave the highway of God, there is insecurity. You know what? I don't know if it's true today up here in the Metroplex. I know that it probably is down in Palestine where I've had the opportunity to work for a number of years. And I've been there 35 years, as Maxie said. And someone asked me not long ago, they said, well, how are you able to stay for 35 years? And I said, well, when I first went there, they told me they didn't like a whole lot of preaching and I was about as near nothing as they could find. 
Judas was a loyal and faithful servant of God at one time. Did you know that? Jesus, listen, in referring to him, takes a quote from the Old Testament, and he says in Psalms 41 in verse 9, he says he refers to Judas in this way, as mine own familiar friend. Isn't that something? Why he's talking about Judas like you're talking about an old buddy you went to school with. He says, Judas was mine own familiar friend. But because of his greed and his envy and his betrayal of Christ, he was lost. Listen, he is a true example of paradise lost. Judas had power over demons at one time in the book of Mark chapter 6, 7 through 13. He preached the gospel and even could heal according to Matthew 10, verse 1 through 20. Certainly Jesus did not choose an unsaved man to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, to encourage the weak, or to represent that kingdom of God. Had he been a devil, wouldn't have done it, didn't do it. But the Bible teaches in the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 15 through 25, that Judas by transgression fell. You see what happened was that Judas got off the Lord's highway. And there is no security for any of us who get off the Lord's highway. For 2 Peter chapter 2, 20 says, It is better for a man to have never known the way of righteousness than to know it and then depart from it. He is like the sow that returns to the wallowing in the mire and the dog that returns to its own vomit. That's pretty graphic, folks, but he says that's the way that it really is. His weakness was that of power and money. And it caused his fall. And it was not until the Last Supper that the devil entered Judas. Well, he'd been with Jesus for three years in his ministry. Walking the Lord's highway. Jesus even trusted him. He let him carry the money bag. You don't let someone do that you don't trust. The devil led him to betray Jesus, Matthew 26. Think about it. Christ could never have lost Judas if he'd not been in a saved relationship. You can't fall from something where you've never been. Judas fell from grace. You can't lose something you never have. I believe in the security of the believer, but I believe that it is conditional. And I believe the Lord's highway is the secure way. Jesus said to the church at Smyrna, did he not? In Revelation 2 and verse 10, he said, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. He said, The devil will cast you into prison, and that you shall find yourselves in tribulation for ten days. But be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. That brings me to the last thought. The Lord's highway is a toll road. Many teach tonight that the price or the fare for your salvation was paid in its entirety at the cross. And you have nothing whatsoever to do regarding your salvation. Now, I believe the price was paid. And you know what? The Bible says when Jesus comes again, he's coming to reward every man according as his work shall be. Let me tell you something. You know, there are two things oftentimes that define us in the church with regard to works. There are works of merit, and then there are works of obedience. And there's a tremendous difference. 
I was telling our brethren yesterday down in Palestine, I said, you know, we're, we're saved by grace. Paul says that in Ephesians 2, verse 8. He says, for by grace he is saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He says, listen, your works are not going to save you. Works of merit will not get you into heaven, but works of obedience will. If that's not the case, what did Paul mean in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7 through 9? When he said to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Oh, the gospel has facts to be believed, but it also has, listen, commands that must be obeyed. And there is a difference between works of merit and works of obedience. Let me share with you the difference. Works of merit say, hey, you know, if I do this and that and this and that and all these things that people want me to do and what I think I need to be doing religiously, then God will have to give me heaven. And you feel in your own way that you kind of earned your way there. I mean, how could God deny me after all that I've done for him? But here's the difference. You see, works of obedience says, God, because of what you have done, I am serving you, I am obeying you, I am loving you. This is my way to say to you, thank you for the salvation that I have in Christ. That's the difference. Do I think I earn salvation because I believe in Jesus Christ? No, I believe in Christ. Because of what he did for me at Calvary. And you know why I repent of my sins? Not thinking that my repentance is going to get me into heaven. But I believe that because Jesus died for my sin and I believe in him and I repent of him, God knows that I love him. And when I get into the water of baptism, it is an act of faith on my part that says, God, I want to show you that I want to be cleansed. And I want to be not only pardoned, but purified. It's a work of obedience. And that's why Paul says, and he clarifies it in the book of Ephesians 2 again. He says, for we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Works of merit, no, works of obedience. And there's a difference, folks. Jesus says there is a toll. Jesus taught that there is a cost. Now, if that's not evidence from what our Lord taught in the book of Matthew chapter 16, that I am sadly mistaken here. But he said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever would save his life will lose it, and yet he that would lose his life for my sake and the kingdom, the same shall find it. He said, which of you would go out and start building a tower and you didn't have enough money to finish building that tower? And he says, you know what's going to happen. They'll be sitting on the side laughing at you and scoffing at you because you didn't have enough money to complete what you started out to do. Count the cost. We've heard many sermons on it. There is a cost that is involved. There is a toll that must be paid. And every day it costs you something to be a Christian, whether you believe it or not. David said in the Old Testament, I'll not offer unto the Lord that which costs me nothing. And for the person who thinks that it doesn't cost him to be a Christian is in disillusionment. It does cost you to be a Christian. And maybe, maybe the reason that some people have been led to believe that is because maybe we're not teaching the truth anymore regarding what God commands of us. Sometimes the only time we ever talk about faith or repentance 
or confession or baptism is at the end of a sermon. And we get right down to the end of it. And most generally, preachers today rarely even talk about it then. And the invitation appeal goes something like this. If we can help you, then please come to the front. And you got folks sitting out there in the pew thinking, help me do what? We need to get back to preaching and teaching Jesus again, folks. And I'm going to tell you something. That's the way you grow the church. That's the way you get people on the Lord's highway. A week ago tonight, one of the elders in Palestine along with myself had the opportunity to study with a young man who was a member of denomination. His wife was a member of the Lord's church, been unfaithful for a while. Got off the highway. We went out and studied with him and talked to him about the way of God. We shared with him the simple truth of the gospel of Jesus. About 10 o'clock that night, that young man said, I want to be a Christian. I want to be baptized. I want to get on the Lord's highway. And we immediately took him to the baptistry and baptized him for the remission of his sins. I know, listen, I know that's not popular in every church of Christ today, folks. But I'm going to tell you something I have never, nor will I in the future, ever play to popularity. I will preach the truth, the unadulterated word of God in its simplicity and its purity. And I want to call every preacher here tonight back to the word of God. Get back to preaching and teaching Jesus. Get back to the mission of the Lord's church. That is evangelizing and saving the souls of lost men, bringing them onto the highway of God and helping them know that the way to heaven is the Lord's highway. It is the only way. And how terrible it would be for us to fail. You know, God often called his people back. We're often reminded of the nearness of God to his people. Long ago, a prophet was sent to Asa, who was the king of Judah in the Old Testament. And the message of God was very simple. The message was in 2 Chronicles 15 and verse 2. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And when Asa heard these words, you know what Asa did? Asa took courage. The people assembled, and according to the book of 2 Chronicles 15, the Bible says that they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, with all their heart and soul. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 15, verse 15, that same text, that they sought God eagerly, and he was found by them. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. Much of what we see in today's world is a wasteland of broken hearts, broken lives, broken homes. There is no rest, and sin is ravaging our land. And the sorrow of the world does indeed, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, work death. And when sin is finished, it produces death. James chapter 1 and verse 15. So God's call to those of us who are preachers and teachers of the will of God is to lead men to the highway of God before it's too late. Someday you and I are going to die. I want to tell you something. There was no more apprehensive moment for me than the night I lay in that emergency room at Trinity Valley Medical Center in Palestine. Really, I guess you could say suspended between life and death. A number of things go through your mind when you're laying there. 
You know, until you've ever really come face to face with death, it's hard to get real with Jesus, isn't it? Mike Hansis was a man who began to make arrangements for his own death, his physical demise. He bought a grave plot and then expect, inspected his property, as they say, once a week. Why, well, he'd go out to the cemetery and he would meticulously trim the grass on Memorial Day and placed a small potted geranium on the grave. He said, I want to see flowers there now. He says, I won't be able to do that when I'm gone. Then Mike went to the funeral home to purchase a casket and a vault, and he said, I want to buy my new home. And every time he passed the funeral home, he stopped by to see his casket. Sounds pretty morbid, doesn't it? He said, that's where I'm going to live someday. And he would even say it cheerfully. Next, he ordered a headstone as well as flowers for his own funeral. Then he called his nephew, Nick Callis, and his family up in Dearborn, Michigan, asking them to come to see him, saying, I have something I want to show you. And after they all dined together... Mike portioned out his personal effects to his family, then handed Nick his will. He took one step toward the table and collapsed, dropping dead of heart failure. Mike Hansus made every arrangement but one. That was to get right with God, to get on the Lord's highway. I hope you're on the highway of God tonight. And I hope you're traveling, and I hope you never take a detour. I hope you never get off on the service road. It'll lead you in some other direction. But I hope you'll stay true and loyal and faithful to God. I want to go to heaven, and I know you do too. But there is one way. It's the pure way. It's the simple way. Why, it's the narrow way. It's the only way. And if out of a belief in Jesus tonight, if you're here in this audience, and you could quite possibly be here tonight, and not be a child of God, a Christian, and if that's the case, and you're going down another highway, not the highway that leads to heaven, but a highway that leads to hell, banishment from God. But the Lord calls you tonight to his highway. And if you believe in his son Jesus Christ as the son of God, and out of a deep faith for God, you're willing to give up things that could keep you from staying on the Lord's highway and doing his will and honoring him. And you're willing to confess with your lips tonight the Lord Jesus as the only son of God, the only way that leads to life. And then allow your body to be buried with him in baptism according to the words of our Savior who commanded, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And you can be pardoned and purified and God places you on the highway isn't that a wonderful picture that's God's picture it's not the picture of the church it's his way and it can be your way tonight while we stand and while we sing